Um, my name is Karin Chung. I work as a researcher at the Freie Universiteit in uh, Amsterdam. And I've got the honor to be here today um, as a former young scholar to moderate uh, the last session of the day. And what a wonderful day it was, full of uh, inspiring, engaging uh, presentations. So our last session of the day is uh, titled um, Symbolic Messengers. And I think will uh, prove to be a fitting capstone of our day, um, spanning a great span of time, space, and imagery. So without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker, uh, Lydia. OK, so this is the title of my uh, focus paper, is Kirtimuka, Cross Religions and Centuries. I'm Lydia Karna. I'm from Sapienza University of Rome, and I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> So let's start because I have just eight minutes. We can start from the, um, the etymolo etymology of the word. Kirtimuka uh, is composed by two words, kirti, which means glory, reputation, and muka, which means face, mouth. So it is commonly translated as the face of glory. And as you can see in the image, it is a beastly face uh, with uh, uh, two horns, uh, bulbous eyes, and a wide open mouth. And uh, over the century, uh, the motif became an actual formal archetype which spread through Hindu, Jain, and Buddhist architecture in the Indian subcontinent. So in order to understand the symbolic meaning of, the, uh, of this image, uh, we can look at the reference uh, mythology. Uh, more precisely, the Shiva Purana provides an excellent description of the creation, and I found uh, on the internet uh, this picture which can uh, express the myth. In the first image, you can, see, you can see Shiva with the moon on his head and Rahu. Rahu was um, an emissary of a demon king, Jalandhara, and he went to Shiva, demanding him the beautiful Parvati, who is uh, Shiva's wife. And uh, so the god reacted to this provocation, uh, producing a terrible monster uh, from his uh, third eye, and uh, Rahu was terrified of the awful creature. Uh, thus, uh, thus, he started to implore benevolence uh, and protection to Shiva. Therefore, the god stopped, it, stopped the beast and ordered it to devour itself uh, instead of Rahu. And the monster began to eat itself until uh, only his head uh, was left. <laughs> so for this reason, uh, Shiva renamed him as Kirtimuka and ordered him to stay on the threshold of his temple. And Kirtimuka, uh, for this reason, is mainly located around, around the temple's doors uh, as an apotropaic monster mask, which, through its terrible expression, scares the, the wicked but protects the, uh, the devotees. So you can see here an example of uh, Kirtimuka carved uh, on the pillars. This is the entrance of the Durga temple in uh, Ai Hall. Um, between the 7th and 13th centuries, the Kirtimuka spread widely throughout the entire Indian subcontinent, beginning to entirely cover temple surfaces from the base uh, to the roof. So the transversal use of the Kirtimuka in the Jaina, Hindu, and Buddhist uh, context uh, is surprising, but is uh, understandable since uh, uh, Indian artisans, native artisans, uh, worked uh, indistinctly for every religious community, sharing the same figurative vocabulary. But uh, it would uh, uh, be illogical to uh, find uh, this uh, image in the Islamic uh, architecture, because uh, in the religious Islamic architecture, figurative representations are not allowed. But we can, see, we can find this, um, this image in a precise typology of a uh, mosque, which uh, uh, is called Konkas Mosque. So here we have a brief contextualization of that type of monument. Um, from the 12th century, the Muslim invasions gave rise to a new political regime in the Indian subcontinent. And uh, from this period, the main architectural outcomes of the military conquest were the desecration of royal temples, because the temples uh, were the places in which the political power of the kings was legitimized by the deity. So destroying the temple meant destroying the king's power. And then building of mosques with the employment of destroyed temple spoils. 
For this reason, we call it Konkas Mosque. And this is an example. This is the Kuwat Ali Islam in Delhi, the first Konkas Mosque of Delhi. So, uh, there was a problem since Tambus spoils were full of figurative elements, and the solution for Islamic conquerors was to deturpate and deface the material before using it. As you can see in these images, uh, while the anthropomorphic figures were subjected to rigorous disfigurement, uh, there was no such rigor towards the Kirtimuka, which, uh, um, which often remained intact and recognizable. I don't know if in the image you can see here, for example, there was an image here, images, anthropomorphic figures, and there they were all decapitated. So, the conservation of the motif seems to be a deliberate choice since it emerges both in the 12th century Concas Mosque of the Indo-Gangetic Indo Plan and in the 14th century Concas Mosque of the Deccan Plateau, which actually are the object of my PhD project. So I have personally verified the presence of the Kirtimuka during my first fieldwork in November 2022. And uh, when I visited all these monuments, uh, creating a personal photographic archive. Um, and here you have some images of the Kirtimuka, bands on, uh, of Kirtimuka. This is uh, the Bodshala of Dar. Then we are in Daulatabad, other bands of Kirtimuka, or single Kirtimuka on pillar. And here we are in Warangal, Bijapur, and Bodan. So, the question is, why was the Kirtimuka preserved? I can propose some hypotheses, but I'll also be glad to uh, receive every kind of suggestion from you. And first of all, it is probable that the absence of the body has in part facilitated the continued reuse of this figure. Uh, secondly, it may have been read like a symbol of royalty due to its Leonin aspect. But even in uh, this case, its uh, insistent presence within religious spaces still appears strange. And more likely, the conquerors were aware of the potropaic significance of the Kirtimuka. So maybe they consider it as an image charged with symbolic meaning rather than a problematic figurative element. From a broader point of view, it is possible to interpret uh, the conservation of the Kirtimuka relation to a need for recognition, legibility, um, given that the construction of mosques through the use of spoils is an affirmation of the new political Islamic power. It is therefore necessary that the spoils related to the past power remain architecturally recognizable. So the erasure would have been deliberately incomplete uh, in order to show the intact and recognizable image. And finally, the conservation of the Kirtimuka could be part of a sort of visual translation of the place of worship that could uh, instinctively evoke religious sentiment even in non-Muslim. So this dynamic continuity would contribute to express one type of sacred space in terms of the other. Finally, in any case, the Kirtimuka played an active role in the history of art both before and after the Muslim in Congress, becoming an identifiable element of the construction material which gave architectural form to two distinct political needs, the temples which legitimized Hindu power and the Congress mosques proclaiming Islamic Congress. So, thank you for listening. Um, hi, uh, very good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm Ayin, and today for my topic, I'm looking at a foreign pusaka and how the symbolic meanings of the coach, Kanjang Nyai Jimat from the Dutch East India Company in the mid 18th century is being reinterpreted in local contexts and local terms. So a few focus points quickly. Um, we will look at early encounters between the Dutch and the kings of Mataram and how foreign and local symbolisms are adapted within the Western and local cultures, as well as the appropriation of objects such as diplomatic gifts uh, have been done um, such that it's being reinterpreted into um, local um, symbolisms. 
So early encounters between the Dutch and the kings of Mataram already occurred, and mostly when the Dutch first set foot on Java, their intentions could be claimed to be mostly uh, based on trade and economic interests. And the initial expeditions to the archipelago were spurred by the desire for trading by the Dutch merchants. Um, the relationship between the Dutch and the Javanese rulers had its highs and lows, and some embassies were more successful than others. And while some of the embassies sent to the Susuhunan of Mataram did have to pay tributes uh, consequently, um, the relationship itself was not so consistent between them. The Treaty of Gyante in 1755 is a turning point in a way that um, the Dutch actually got more involved in the local politics. There were a lot of internal political upheavals within the, um, between the sultans of Mataram itself. And to stabilize the local situation, the Dutch actually had to intervene um, also in terms of their economic interests because for trade to flourish, they, um, the local political situation actually had to be improved. So at the Treaty of Gyanti in 1755, um, the Dutch actually mediated the, um, the political meeting between the Sultan of um, Matarams, uh, between um, Pakubono and Hamunkubono I, and this Treaty of Gyanti actually resulted in certain gifts from the Dutch, um, which was provided to both uh, sides of the kings. Um, the, the VOC actually provided trumpeters, elephants, Persian horses, and a coach amongst many other diplomatic gifts. Our focus for today um, as part of the gift that was given is actually this coach, uh, which is still being used in Yogyakarta itself. Um, its local name is Kanjeng Nyai Jimat, which is the uh, local pusaka name given to it. And its, its significance within the Western and the local Javanese context uh, needs to be looked at how royal coaches and carriages in Western and Asian royal contexts have uh, looked at it. Royal coaches in both Western and Asian contexts are seen to be symbols of power. It's quite common for us to see carriages and coaches being used as part of parades or processions in the Western context. And likewise, in the Asian context, the idea of carriages or coaches as symbols of power used by the kings is not so uncommon either, as can be seen on the right-hand side of the image, which shows the, um, the procession of royal cremation ceremony um, in Thailand itself. So, the concept of the object itself, the coach or carriages as a symbol of power, is something that is understood between both Western and local contexts in Asian, um, in Asian countries. So how did a gift, a diplomatic gift that is clearly Western, become a pusaka? Uh, and here we will take a look at Kanjeng Nyai Jimat itself. Firstly, we need to look at what is a pusaka in the local context. Um, to put it simply, it's considered sacred heirlooms and can also be considered as the royal regalia. And a pusaka is more or less interpreted as sacred objects that possess good luck or it brings good luck to the bearer itself. It's usually inherited from one generation to another. And it also symbolizes um, inner strength. So, the ones who possess the pusaka does not only um, symbolize power through the object, but is seen to have an inner strength that is not possessed by any other human being, and hence it elevates his position within the society itself. So when we take a look at Kanjeng Nyai Jimat, is it a Western or a local object? Um, it's obviously Western made, as can be seen here when we compare between these two carriages. Um, the image at the bottom is another carriage that is in the National Coach Museum in Lisbon, Portugal. And both carriages are very similar in a way that in terms of shape and form, and also they indicate a single rider within the carriage itself. Um, 
the carriage itself is made of tropical uh, wood on the base and it's decorated in gold gilded casket and um, at the bottom part of it, it's red bordered with um, gold pipings around it. And obviously, that's also, it's also richly ornamented on the frames and also on the bottom parts of um, the coach itself. The footboard is of the main concern here because, um, as we can see here, it features a female figurehead. Uh, and this is located right at the front of the footboard itself. Such ornaments or designs can also be seen on the print on the right here. Um, this is actually the new designs for ornamenting and embellishing coaches and carriages. Uh, so it's a reference or a print, a printed reference on how to decorate coaches and carriages uh, during the late 17th century. So a lot of the, when we compare it, we can see that the female figurehead um, appears on the print as well. And not only on the carriages, when we look at prints of, for references of European furniture, we also see a lot of the female figureheads appearing on these designs as well. So the significance of the female figurehead itself is important because it, within the Javanese um, cosmology itself, the female figurehead has been associated to the mystical being, which is um, Kanjeng Ratu Kidul, which is the queen of the Southern Sea. Um, so the figurehead is believed as a local symbol that embodies the spiritual power of the queen of the Southern Sea. And um, the queen of the Southern Sea is also seen to be like this mystical partner of the sultans of Mataram. So in a way, She's connected to him in a marital sense, but also because she possesses this mystical power, her, his association to her itself, um, she kind of let, lends her power to him through this association. And also her, um, her being imbued in the female figurehead itself, it enhances the power of the coach or the royal carriage as an object on its own. Other than the carriage being um, enforced as a status of a pusaka, um, the power of the object itself is being reinforced and manifested through common rituals that are being done annually. So here you can see that even up to this day in Yogyakarta itself, annually, they actually have the ritual of the siraman where the carriage is being taken out into public and it's being cleansed by the Abdi Dalam or the royal servants of, um, of the Kraton itself. And on this day, it's a big celebration because people from all over the country would usually gather to just look at the process of the ritual itself. And most importantly, they are there to gather the water, the leftover water from cleansing the carriage itself because they believe that the carriage holds such significant power that even the water that is used to cleanse it would be able to give them um, power and also have the ability to cure illnesses that um, people who drink it um, could have. So we can see here how from a normal um, object or like a diplomatic gift from Europe itself has been appropriated within the local context um, where the foreignness of the object itself elevates the status of the coach to that of a pusaka. And with the embodiment of the sacred being, which is the Kanjeng Nyanyi Ratu Kidul, um, the power of the pusaka itself is enhanced and this is reinforced um, in the eyes of the local community through sacred state rituals that is being done annually. And this also implants the idea of the power that the carriage itself holds within the community up to this day. Other than that, we can also see how the social life of the coach itself had evolved from just being a vehicle or object of transportation to a diplomatic gift that is being used for negotiation 
and then to a local pusaka or sacred heirloom possessing great power and also lending agency to local rulers. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Mm, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Xin Wu Luo. So today I would like to present a very unusual series of piece paper paintings. They are not Chinese, but with Peruvian subjects. And so in this series now is in the collection of the Dutch National Museum of Road Cultures. Uh, first, I would like to briefly introduce what is the piece paper painting. So uh, in the 19th century, there are two uh, main forms of Chinese export art. One is the export ceramics, and another one is export paintings. And the piece paper paintings were one of the most popular export art products back then. So this is a material of piece paper. Pen uh, piece paper. So as you can see on the right, uh, that's the plant of that. Uh, it's interesting that during the lunch break, the curator Qin Ling Wang told me that there are actually two of them in the Rex Museum garden. So if you are interested in that, you can just try to find them. So piece paper is made of the spongy tissue of, the, of this plant, which uh, originally um, grows in Taiwan and southern China. Piece paper is a thin slice of the plant's uh, cylindrical stem, as you can see in the middle. It is peeled off by rolling it, and is then dried and trimmed without any further processing. So piece paper, it has the characteristics of softness, whiteness, and transparency, as well as the velvety surface make it as an ideal base for applying watercolor. These features also make piece paper particularly suited to miniature painting, which was in line with the fashion um, for the miniature portrait painting in Euro Europe back then. The characteristics of piece paper and being cheaper than other types of Chinese paper, it was mass produced with the flourishing Chinese export art industry as the Qing government was forced to open up in the 19th century. Piece paper paintings were favored by foreigners who traveled to China in the 19th century due to their smaller size, as you can see at the bottom right. Um, and the de um, depictions of the Chinese themes with the Western oil painting styles. Uh, now I would like you to, to um, go through a very common themes of the piece paper paintings. So it uh, includes the figuring paintings of Chinese people and their daily life. And some uh, sheep portraits and some port views. And also some punishments of Chinese people and some tortures. And Chinese flora and fauna as well as the um, production process of, for example, um, tea and also the silk. And the right one is uh, one of the processing of making piece paper itself. However, now let's take a look at this set of piece paper painting. As you can see very clearly that um, they are depicted not Chinese subjects, but Peruvian subjects. But that raised a question that how can we know it's Peruvian? So actually, this is a very special show. It's called Cosmobrism, refers to an artistic or literary representation of regional daily life and phlogrotic costume which developed in Spain during the 16th century and 17th century. It later spread to Hispanic America 
particularly in Peru, and became a very popular subject in the first half of the 19th century. In this genre, the most characteristic one is tapada. As you can see here, um, tapada means field woman, which was a female dress practice of fielding in Spain and also South America under the Spanish colonial rule between the 16th and 19th century. But uh, how can this be explained? Why the Peruvian subjects were depicted on the Chinese piece paper? Uh, so this is related to the circulation of this um, kind of piece paper paintings. So it's all through trade. Um, as we know, compared to the trade network between China and European countries, the commerce between Peru and China is less known. The Peru-China trade was uh, a result, as, as a result of wars of independence of several South American countries between the 1810s and 1830s. European and North American merchants were consequently granted access to Peru natural resources, mainly gold and silver, for trading with China. So Canton as support uh, where foreigners were, were allowed to have trade with Chinese, um, an average of five ships usually sailed from Lima to Canton. The circulation of goods between Peru and China continued and even increased during the 1840s. The identification of the piece paper paintings with these Peruvian subjects show that the paper and watercolor pigments were of Chinese origin. In other collections, there are also the stamped labels of the Chinese artists on the album of some sets. Also, I would like to introduce an iconic um, Peruvian artist that had a great influence on Cosmobrism show. Um, Pancho Firo. Um, Pen uh, Firo and his contemporaries created a large number of paintings that depicted that Tapada and also other um, folkloric of Peru. Here we can actually compare the work that uh, made by Firo and the piece paper paintings made by the Chinese artists. It's very clearly that, as you can see, the figures in the paintings, um, the color schemes that used here, and also the composition of the paintings, they are strikingly similar. And this is another comparison. comparison. So it's, it's not a coincidence. So for the um, export painting studios in Canton in the 19th century, run by the Chinese artists, they had similar assembly line-like production. So the themes of the piece paper paintings, as I showed earlier, um, they produced by each studio actually were quite similar to each other. And also the subjects would usually be within the limitations of the common themes. So um, there is a um, probable that the circulation of the piece paper paintings with these Peruvian subjects was. So firstly, the original artworks uh, made by the Peruvian artists with these shown from Peru, they were carried by merchants to Canton and afterwards they were copied and made by the Chinese artists uh, in Canton. And then later they were carried back to Lima and were sold there. So um, actually, the, uh, I also want to introduce um, other piece paper paintings collections in the public collections that we know. Yeah. Um, so there are a total like 120 surviving piece paper paintings, but the existence of this set showing a combination of Chinese paper and watercolor 
and Western painting manners and Peruvian subjects, it proves a unique artistic interaction between Cantonese and Lehman artists and reveals a rich communication between China and Peru and the international trade network, as well as the circulation of art in the 19th century. Thank you. So, um, good afternoon. And uh, this is the very last presentation, so I can imagine you're quite tired, but I promise this one will be worth it said every researcher about their research. Um, so the title is Tracing the Tattoo Tradition of the Ivan Dykes in Borneo. And why is that word tracing? So tattoo traditions are transmitted from generation to generation via oral traditions and storytelling. And so today I'll be telling you a story about Ivan tattoo art. And unlike the amazing presentations before that we're talking about, let's say, objects, we're now going to discuss the human body as a walking, living, breathing skinscape for tattoo art. But every story has a point of enunciation, and so too, this one. So I'm a double degree master's student, and my research focuses on the tribal tattoo revival in Indonesia from the Dayaks, uh, that means indigenous person, in Borneo, as well as the Mentawai tribes in Sumatra. But today, I specifically want to focus on the Iban Dayaks because their tattoo designs and techniques have been very prevalent in this revival. But to understand the revival, it's really important to also understand uh, the socio-historical context. So what has happened? And that leads me to the research question. Why has Iban tattoo art changed? in West Kalimantan and Sarawak uh, from the pre-modernity until the 20th century. Now, our story will go to different stages of history. And what was the state of Iban tattoo art across various time space scapes, so to speak? So first, we're going to go way back in time to pre-modernity. Now, I put traditional in scare quotes <laughs> because uh, we should be critical of what it means traditional and modern, especially when you look at ethnographic accounts of tattooing. Um, because often what means traditional is being associated with the East and primitivity, whereas modern is being associated with the West and development. Now, this is not only very ambiguous because we live in a very complex social world where such dichotomies do not really hold water, but at the same time, it also reproduces a very colonial conception of world order. So in my research, traditional is based on what my sources have said, as well as defining more of a period of time, something like before 1500, and I wanted to clarify that for our presentation. Now, tattoo traditions, they come into being through collective norms, collective values, so to understand how this even tattoo art in its very initial state came into being, we have to go back to the social organization of the, let's say, traditional Iban communities. Unlike colonial European accounts that say that the Iban were pirates, they were actually farmers. So their main um, form of economic organization was the sweat and cultivation of dry rice. And every one or two years, they would move to a new rice field. But they had this nomadic lifestyle and this agricultural lifestyle, but it was in alignment with nature. And so they had an animist religion. It is believed that everything has a spirit, not only we as human beings, but also inanimate objects, such as the rice field, such as a wooden chair. Now, to protect the cosmic balance between the human world and the spirit world, there are a lot of rituals. And so too, tattooing is very ritualized in traditional even communities. And nature is the source. If you look at even tattoo art, all the designs are based on the flora and fauna um, in their environment. And the technique is not the cool machines that we know today, um, but these are actually two wooden sticks. And at the end of one wooden stick is a thorn needle. And the ink is also based on the natural resources. So it's a suit mixed with sugar cane. Now, what is the purpose of tattooing in these communities? Well, the Iban didn't have a hereditary ranking. Um, their social organization is based on a prestige system. So for men, there's a lot of prestige in uh, tribal wars, headhunting, and going on a journey, also known as Bajalai. 
For women, it's more bound to the arts and the crafts. So I want to focus a bit on this image, for example. Uh, when they're very skilled in um, weaving, for example, they will get tattoos on their lower arms or their hands. As you can see, this woman has um, almost like a bracelet tattooed on her lower arms, and this is signaling that she is a very skilled weaver. Um, but this brings me to the second uh, point of why tattooing is important. So tattooing does not only mark someone's social status and prestige, but it can also give spiritual protection. If weavers, for example, were dyeing cloth red, it could attract bad spirits. And these uh, tattoos would give the spiritual protection to wane off bad spirits. The same goes for the, uh, actually the one, this image was way better. Why did I think of this? So you see the two rosettes on his shoulders. This is called Bunga Terong tattoo. Um, it comes with different designs and the placement is very important, it's on the shoulders. And it's firstly a rites of passage for Iba men to signal that they have gone from a boy to a man. But the placement on the shoulders is really important as well because it offers spiritual protection for all the hardships and struggles that one may encounter when going on a journey and symbolically resting on the shoulders. And the third reason or purpose that is not really highlighted by enough scholars, I believe, there was one and I was like latching onto that because of like, yes. Um, <laughs> it's the reason of physical attraction. So those even individuals that were heavily tattooed were more attractive as marital partners and even without the aesthetic, just as a symbolic message. And I'm actually thinking, wow, my presentation fits the theme of this panel. Um, it's that, uh, um, it signals that someone has the mental and spiritual strength to endure this very painful process of tattooing because it was very long and uh, their tattoo designs are a lot of black work. So. But what has happened? So why do we speak of a decline? In Southeast Asia, there was a spread of Islam as well as a spread of Christianity. And the spread of both monotheist religions led to a decline of tattooing amongst various indigenous communities. Then I started to think, okay, my hypothesis is what has happened uh, when Islam arrived to Borneo? Because it did. Um, it's a bit unsure when this exactly happened because there's a disagreement between European accounts and um, the um, Bornean accounts of when Islam arrived in Borneo. So it's somewhere in the 15th or 16th century, but it is very sure that um, Islam, uh, yeah, Islam arrived with uh, Muslim traders from India and Java to Borneo. Now, it spread in Sarawak and the Kapuas Basse, which are even territories. So one could say, well, yeah, it did affect even tattooing. But it actually didn't, because the Iban Dayaks were based in the Bornean hinterland, and more specifically, the northern Kapuas Basse, which made them have a position in which they could reject the increasing influence of the Muslim Malays, so they could uh, keep their autonomy in that sense and keep practicing even tattooing. But, of course, we have spoken of a decline, so what did affect even tattooing was European imperial humanitarianism. Now, I mm, assume that you are quite familiar maybe with the white man's burden, I hope, <laughs> but it's an ideology that came to rise around like 1830s, and it's this idea that this, let's say, white men from the Euro-Anglo sphere is civilized and has the moral duty to educate or civilize the um, noble savage or the colonial subjects. Now, Northern Borneo becomes part of the British imperial system in 1849, of, uh, 1841, sorry, when Sir James Brooke helps to crush uh, a rebellion against the Sultanate of Brunei. He is awarded with the governorship over Sarawak, and soon thereafter, the southern part of Borneo becomes part of the Dutch Empire. Now, both imperial powers believe that they know better, and it's time to educate these Bornean locals. Um, and they pursued two initiatives that actually led to the decline of even tattoo art, or changed even tattoo art. So the first initiative is uh, anti-headhunting policies. Now, headhunting is a very important um, practice amongst a lot of indigenous communities across the world but especially for the Iban, because for them it was a way of establishing cosmic, economic and political balance among different tribes. Uh, to clarify, head hunting is literally hunting other members of a tribe and severing their heads as a trophy. 
but it had a lot of spiritual meaning for them as well. Now, the Dutch and the British, they imposed a lot of um, imprisonment, fines, punitive expeditions, and more indirectly, uh, migration restrictions as well as heavy taxations to really <laughs> stop headhunting, so to speak. And they succeed. So by the 20th century, there's no more headhunting. And so too, the headhunting tattoos are actually not that prevalent anymore. Now, we've already looked at the Bunga Turung tattoo on the shoulders. And one that I find really interesting as well, um, it sometimes comes with different designs. It's also based on uh, the individual specifically that's being tattooed is the tattoo on the throat, which is also uh, a headhunting tattoo, and it's a very, very painful one. Um, and if we look very closely, I'm really happy it's quite a large screen, but I'm not sure if it's clear. If you look at the middle picture, or picture in the middle, you can see that there are tattoos on the fingers, um, and these are also geometric patterns signaling that a headhunter has been very successful. Now, the second initiative, is um, the invitation of Christian missionaries. So the spread of Christianity actually served colonial interests because firstly, it helped to civilize this wild savage, so to speak. Uh, and again, it also contributed to stop hand hunting because when converting to Christianity, they would abandon their animist religion and also certain traditions. The second thing is that it would also prevent the increasing influence of Muslim Malays um, and the third, this one is particularly relevant for the Dutch Empire, actually. Um, when the Iban converted to Christianity, it would actually serve the colonial regime because now they, could, they would have a sort of common denominator. And um, it was more likely than for the Christian Ibans to be positioned in some lower ranking positions of the imperial administration. So this indirect imperial rule. But Christianity has a slow start. The Christian missions actually quite fail. And it's, I think it's a really interesting thing to see that once um, the um, Dutch leave and the British leave, uh, Christianity actually gains a lot of uh, followership in, um, in Borneo. And you can see it in the statistics as well. By 2000, almost 70% of the Iban are Christian. Um, so yeah, they abandon their animist religion, and so too tattooing. So now we've walked through different phases. We've gone through pre-modernity, then we went to the 15th, 16th century, then the 18th, 19th, and now we're arriving in an era when Borneo has become independent. And mind you, it's divided into three different areas, right? This one, this event, has been particularly relevant for the negative stigmatization of tattooing in the Indonesian context. So President Suharto, um, yeah, he engaged in what was called the Petrus killings, or the mysterious shootings. So on 28 August 1983, an Indonesian police officer was mysteriously killed. Now, a lot of media attention has gone to this event, but it was also a time when a new face of the criminal arose. So what happened is the series of extrajudicial killings of tattooed individuals um, also known as the Gali, the gangsters. And they were killed by um, militaries dressed in civilian clothes. Mind you, these were extrajudicial killings. And their corpses were dumped in the street, in rivers, next to military posts. So President Suharto said that this was a way of shock therapy to educate the people of what does it mean to be a good citizen. But this negative stigmatization of tattooing as it being criminal is still uh, something that echoes today. Hence this Muslim punk um, poster that I find really interesting, which says in Bahasa Indonesia, uh, tattoos are not criminal. Um, so still being in the 20th century and more to contemporary times, of course, centuries of European colonialism do not go away with the blink of an eye. So there is still some sort of legacy, right? and with these European standards of civilization. Now, one of that is this idea that purity and simplicity is more valued as aesthetically pleasing than body modification. What also happens uh, by the 20th century is that the prestige system of the Iban Dayaks has changed. So there's no more headhunting, 
but what is still prestigious is going on a journey, and quite in a similar way as we have. So if you go working abroad, studying abroad, that's still considered as something prestigious. Uh, even for my research, also part of this research, I'll be going to Indonesia for a year, conducting field work, and people are telling me, wow, so cool, you know? Um, but what I found interesting is that there are even dialects who get the places where they go to tattooed on their arms or somewhere else. So for example, Surakarjati, Singapore, was tattooed on someone's lower arm, meaning I've already worked in Singapore. Yeah. Um, what is now happening with even tattoo art? It's no longer a mark of social status, um, but it is still seen as a way of bodily decoration. And more recently, uh, and this is, I guess, part of that tribal tattoo revival, there are Iban Dayak youths who want to have these um, Iban designs tattooed on their body to signal their ethnic identity. But in a way, Iban tattoo art has also become part of global tattoo culture. So you can find Iban tattoo art also at international tattoo conventions. But some concluding thoughts. So if we would really define Iban tattoo art as based on certain characteristics, a very essentialist view, we can conclude, OK, yeah, there's no longer Iban tattoo art in this traditional way, right? But if we take a more constructivist perspective and let go of that essentialism and more think about even the two art as an ongoing artistic discourse, we could say that it has survived. And maybe there's not a revival, but a revision. And I find it really interesting that today we will find tribal tattooed bodies, so to speak, such as um, Rico's body, uh, that has the traditional Bunga Terum tattoos, yet also an American style tattoo. So you get almost like a mixture. And I've talked about this with Doreen Müller like a year ago almost, uh, that you almost get these uh, neo-traditional bodies, so to speak. So it's open to our interpretation and it's always ongoing. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think maybe one last afterthought is that, yeah, there are still sometimes negative images or ideas about tattoos. Like, of course, I'm biased. I have tattoos. Um, <laughs> and maybe this presentation made you think a bit deeper about the very interesting and complex history of tribal tattoos beyond, let's say, popular culture. So thank you so much. <laughs>
Uh, thank you so much for those questions. So funny, actually. I thought there's no way someone who's an expert in Borneo will be here, and you are that one. So I love that. No, like, it makes me give all the extra connotations. So starting with the question about Christianity, uh, it is very complex, especially when you look at the legacy of those borders of their area, because the traditional, even territories, actually cross those nation state borders. Now, the Methodist church indeed spreads among the Ibandags in Sarawak a lot, but when you look at um, West Kalimantan, um, there's a lower percentage of Christians, actually, uh, of Iban Christians, uh, and some that want to stick more to the, um, their animist religion. Um, but, of course, this is ongoing research, and I'm really curious about the oral history um, found during uh, the interviews that I'll be conducting from August until next year in July. Um, the second question was about the Petrus killings and how it happened. Okay, so um, it was on the 28th of August in 1983, and a policeman was killed, but there was a lot of mystery around it because his body was mysteriously found. And maybe the body has even been moved somewhere. And it's still unclear who it did. Um, but there was one newspaper at that time, and I can actually send you the book that's, yeah, by Siegel, um, and it's called Postkota. It was a Japanese um, newspaper. And so the interesting thing that Postkota did was um, publishing a lot of images, shocking images of all these bodies, almost daily, with shocking titles, but further context was always missing. So it also fed into that negative stigmatization of tattoos as it being criminal because the only information that people then had was just a so shocking image and a shocking title. And we could say, yeah, you have to do further research. But I mean, come on, you like read the newspaper and if you see the same message every day with the same images, it's um, creating a new discourse about what it is to be criminal and what a criminal looks like. Yeah. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the room? Yes, I see somebody there. Yeah, uh, I have a question for Sing Wu, and thank you so much for your like presentation on the trans-Pacific things like other than the in Indian Ocean, and then from the use from the use of plants, Tong Chao, and then also to the Canton Fracture, and then to the like the Peruvian and the Cantons exchange, I. I actually wonder about the after story of those pitch paper. How did they end up? Like, do you have any idea about how did they end up in the little one? Yeah. Um, because this is a private collection, and uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to tell some stories about the donator. Uh, yeah. Ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because it's donated, it was donated by a lady. Uh, so as far as we know, there is no direct connection between the ladies and any other Asian traces. But uh, that's a little bit unfortunate. But she has three brothers used to have connections with, with Indonesia. Um, so that might be a way how she ended up um, collecting this collection. But the, any other further information we didn't know yet. So if she has a so association with Indonesia, would it mean that like those um, those pitch paper were not collected like from Peru, maybe from Philippines? Yeah, or yeah. Those Could be place, places. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Is uh, Tetrapanax paper still being produced? Uh, sorry? Uh, Tetrapanax paper theory. Piece of paper. Yeah, yeah. It's still being produced. Uh, I think so. It's still um, being produced in a very small amount of um, production in Taiwan. And also, I, I don't think they are still producing in Canton anymore, yeah, mm -hmm. but still in Taiwan. Do you have an address? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. I see a question in the back of the room. Hi, 
Hi, um, I have the question for uh, sorry, Talisha. It's a reading pleasure to listen to your presentation because when I was in Taiwan, I was a curator in the museum and I had the privilege to curate an uh, exhibition about Iban people. And then that was really required me a lot of wonderful memories. And, but then at that time, we didn't have time to have further research because as in Taiwan, we have uh, many tribes of the indigenous people who are also Austral nation family uh, that share the part of the Yiban people. And then the same that we have, not, not me, I'm just an ordinary Han people. So <laughs> but then I was just curious about, uh, since they share so many common uh, rituals, like a uh, hunting heads, and also um, not just for the enemy, but also to show the courage. And also they had a tattoo, even though the different parts, um, some of them are also in on the face, or some different parts meaning with a different meanings. But do you think their puppet has some a common symbol, symbol that they share the similar meanings since the ancient time, or do they have like a similar language when they are t uh, making their tattoo, mm. or is there maybe something in common to mm. show that they are actually from the same um, Austro nation family? That out yeah. of curiosity, thank you. Yeah, no, great question. Uh, well, as a critical ethnographer, I find it really hard to say that things are similar, especially considering my insider-outsider positionality. So on the one hand, I am an insider because I'm tattooed and I'm part of the Indonesian diaspora, but at the same time, I'm very much of an outsider, right? Like, I'm not Iban Dayak. And I uh, think, for me, it's very, um, it would be problematic to say that things are definitely similar, right? So I think there can be similarities, and it's just an interesting phenomenon on itself that there have been various indigenous communities across the world, part of the Austronesian family, but also in Latin America and other spaces that practice tattooing. Um, that in itself is already really cool, right? Yeah, indeed, and so I'm doing that in my research right now, in a way, where I look at the Mentawai tattoo art, as well as the uh, Dayak tattoo art, and that's already so complex, because if you look at Borneo, you have different tribes. You have the Iban Dayaks, or you also have the Kenya and the Kayan. So the Kenya and the Kayan, for example, had only female tattooers, whereas with the Iban, it's male tattooers. Also, the uh, designs are very different, so some accounts say that actually even tattoo art comes from the Kenya and the Kayan, uh, but it's a simplified version. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for, again, wonderful papers. My question is for, for Lydia and Ayn together, actually. Um, you both were talking about sacred and about power, um, and I just wondered whether you could both uh, say something about the things that you felt were similar, even though you were talking about very different materials and times and spaces, but listening to each other, which were the things that you thought were kind of similar and were significantly different in one way or another? Go. <laughs> what do you understand first? The question? Yeah. Yeah, but if you want to. <laughs> I mean, um, I, I don't know if I mm, get the question, but the point is the mm, new significance of one symbolic meaning, uh, I mean, one symbolic image, my example, for example, was the Kirtimuka, in another context, uh, something like that. Okay. <laughs> no. Okay. Uh, so... Um, I just mm, I gave you some hypothesis about that uh, new reuse of the symbolic messengers, but uh, I'm sure that is not. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure that is a deliberate choice because uh, I uh, showed you some images with uh, uh, figurative, uh, anthropomorphic figure, uh, cancelled, totally cancelled, and then you can see the Kirtimuka uh, in near the anthropomorphic figures. So I think that this is a instrumentalization of the artistic uh, figure, of the figurative uh, vocabulary uh, for a political uh, need. And uh, uh, so uh, it was like used 
um, some, something that Indians know very well in order to express uh, a huge uh, meaning like the political change of the kingdom or the sultanate. So I don't know if this was the question, but... <laughs> Is it on? Yeah. And so, Michael, yeah. So, the, the hearing you say that, maybe I. Yeah. Does that sound similar to, to what you were talking about? I mean, I, we can all think of the similarities, but do you yeah. respond to that thinking? Yes, there are similarities, or do you feel there are some clear distinctions that make your case quite separate? Apart from the fact, of course, that you are talking about. I mean, a that's different phase. Just within the whole panel itself, there are clearly a lot of overlapping in terms of the idea of symbols and how they translate to power in different contexts, whereby similar iconographies understood within different local contexts are being adopted or being readapted into different concepts of power. Um, it might span across centuries, but how people see or view power, it evolves. And this is, it's always so interesting how an object from centuries back is still being readapted all the way up to these days in terms of tattoos, in terms of material objects, in terms of archaeological digs, and how they are still being reinterpreted still and still being accepted within the community or the society itself. Um, so that's how. I see the differences, but also like the or the overlapping um, platforms that all of us have for today, at least. So yeah. And I saw we had a question from the back of the room. Yes. Hi. Uh, I've got a question about the Kirti Mukha presentation. Um, you talked about um, it being a, a lion-like face and that this might be the reason that the symbol survived conquest. Uh, but did other lion-like symbols also survive that you didn't have the chance to talk about? <laughs> can you repeat the last time? Can, can you take out? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, did other lion-like figures also survive next to the Ah, other Kirti figures Mocha? survive. Okay. Uh, sometimes animals, but not inside of the mosques. Maybe outside. And uh, normally lions and elephants. But inside, uh, just Kirtimuka. And uh, you can find Kirtimuka also uh, close to the, the Mihrab, which is the most sacred spaces of a mosque. So this is really strange, no? Uh, for this reason, I also thought about the uh, visual translation on the sentiment, the religious sentiment, which can express these uh, these images, this image. So, but these are all hypotheses. <laughs> if you have some suggestion, I will be glad to listen to you. <laughs> Do we have any other questions from the room? Oh, yeah, we are at the front. Oh, okay, no, let's start there then. <laughs> uh, I have a question for Lydia as well, because actually it's a little bit uh, the previous uh, question. Uh, after the new mosques were built, was there any incorporation of like the Kitimuka uh, image or or the new mosque where it didn't just the new do building. it went on. You mean it's in not the so, new context? Yeah, because, the, because the old mosque, they were built with the re reclaiming the, the stones and everything of the temples they destroyed. But like you said, maybe it's because they kind of want to use the, the power of the Kirti Mukha and preserve that or, or, or convince people that it's, the, uh, uh, it's kind of a transition. But do you know of any example that uh, they would... Uh, yeah, kind of uh, build newer mosques afterwards. No, 
No. I mean, I'm studying this topic right now, so <laughs> until now I, I, I didn't find another conquest, uh, another mosque, not conquest mosque, uh, yeah. uh, with the Kirtimuk inside. Normally in mosque you can find geometric patterns. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's, it's just similar yes. to, to, to the Islamic tradition and no yeah. incorporation yeah. of previous... Yeah, normally uh, figurative yeah. elements are not allowed. Yeah. So for this reason, in new mosques, uh, Indian mosques, you don't find, you can find uh, the Kirtimuka. For this reason, it called me, uh, the, uh, called my attention because it's really strange uh, and it's a, a phenomenon that you can find just in the, this type of conquest mosque uh, is, uh, is called. <laughs> And, and, and maybe I have a similar question for Ayn, <laughs> because uh, I think that is the same with the Pusaka, the coach Pusaka, mm -hmm. that uh, after, for instance, the, the, the coach will kind of fall apart, then uh, that will, the, the, the whole sequence of having the gift, and, and it, it will kind of end, and it will not be replaced. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think in terms of the Pusaka itself, um, over the years, of course, deterioration will happen, but also it's just a cycle of life where things that can be preserved, but at the end of it, I think in, the, in a lot of Asian cosmologies at least, everything will come to an end, so it's okay for things to deteriorate and then meet the end of its social life. That is just how things and humanity or the world itself um, takes place, so um, I th am I answering your question in a way? Yeah, uh, so I think that's how it just is. There's a lot of things that can be preserved, especially when it's considered a pusaka or even like a tangible heri cultural heritage in today's life, but the concept of objects itself um, in a lot of culture, it's okay to just let it deteriorate and meet the end of its life, I think. It's just a cycle of life in a lot of beliefs, so yeah. Oh, we have a question, Willemijn. Uh, a question for Talisha. I was wondering when you're saying that now the young generation is also um, having the Iban tattoos as a sort of for their identity, is it then important to have them done, applied in the traditional way with the two sticks? Or yes. do you also see examples of people going to, uh, um, uh, the, the, that they do it with the modern machine and just apply the design, so to say? Um, yeah, so my research is about actually, the tat uh, I focus on the tattoo artists who um, practice tattoos or uh, who tattoo. And yes, they use a traditional method because their narrative or the way they give meaning to their practice is that they see it as a form of cultural heritage preservation. Um, there are instances that tattoo artists choose to use the electric machine, but this is only in case when um, they're tattooing a lot of people. So um, one tattoo artist who has been very prevalent in this tattoo revival, um, he, he is called Durka Tattoo. And um, so what he did, he actually goes to Mentawai tribes, uh, many of them who were not able to tattoo because of the sort of uh, oppression of their practice. And so there are individuals who say, I want to get tattooed, but there are so many of them that they uses the electric machine. But mostly actually it is done with the traditional hand tapping. So it's a very long process and it also goes with a lot of rituals. So I also intend to, with consent of course, uh, record these tattoo sessions to also see how it is ritualized, to see the way the body moves, but also the sound. Uh, that is being used because the hand tapping also has a very specific sound to it. And yeah, I would love to send you a video if you're open to it. <laughs> I have a follow-up question for Ayn actually about the degradation because I thought it was very interesting sounding. Um, I know for instance in Europe with like polychrome sculpture, uh, like wooden sculptures that are used in religious ceremonies still, they're often repainted or regilded and you might have multiple, multiple layers. Um, including original layers still. Yeah. So in the case of the Pasaka, would there be, would they still, would they repaint elements of it? it was, I thought it was interesting because you mentioned how they wash them and then the water is 
part of this, it's like sort of the sacred cleansing, but would there also be rituals surrounding like say regilding parts of them or replacing parts of them or do they just, um, yeah. <laughs> I think for the Pusaka itself, as far as I know, there's yeah. no process of in a way conservation, yeah. um, repainting it, etc. because as you can see from one of the photos, the, the face of the carved figure, it's very badly deterior deteriorating because it's constantly exposed to the kemenyan or like uh, the offerings, the smoke offerings given to it. And the only process of preserving it in a way is to cleanse it yearly. And that is about it. Um, there's no specific processes where, conservation processes where it's made to look new again. Um, they, just pre they just let it remain as it is to the yearly cleansing process um, annually as well. And even then, it's a very basic process as well. Just cleansing with the water, and usually with certain types of flowers, and then it's stored back into the museum itself. So yeah. OK, thank you. That's very interesting. Hi, um, I also have a question about the uh, water ritual, actually, for Ayn, <laughs> piggybacking on the series of questions. Um, I was wondering if it's a unique event or within the cultural context, if it's one of many similar kinds of events that happen. And if so, yeah, what is the history of it? Um, actually, the cleansing of Pusaka or secret alums is not just done at a royal family level. Individually, people would also have their own pusaka that is inherited down to their family. A very basic case is a karis, for example, within a family. On the first surah, uh, the first Thursday night, which is considered holy, people would usually do a cleansing process of the pusaka that is within their family. And this is usually a uh, cleansing process of just using lime and um, fragrant water just to make sure that all the dirt is being removed from the objects itself. And it's quite cultural in the Malay archipelago, at least. A lot of people practice it on a very um, more public level in terms of like the royal siraman, uh, pusaka siraman and also on a very individual basis within the family itself. So, yeah. Um, I have a, a follow-up questions for Simu. So, um, I was wondering uh, if there were paintings, uh, I mean, the, the Chinese piece paper uh, paintings circulated internally in China in the 19th century. And um, I was wondering if there were other foreigners rather than Peruvians were depleted as well. Yeah, on, uh, on thank the you for your questions. Yeah. So for your first two questions, um, because it's specifically made for the um, exports, so it's been a, lo a long time that had been underlooked, um, uh, underlooked in China until very lately in a British collector um, and also um, other collectors from worldwide, they donated a, a collections to the Guangdong Museum. And then later, the Chinese people are gradually started to know um, this uncertain type of export art. And for your uh, second question, as far as all the uh, literature I came across, I hadn't found any information about the other foreign uh, subjects, unfortunately. I have a question uh, for Xinhui that sort of ties back into the previous ones. Um, so you showed some of the um, common um, images that's put on these Chinese export paintings, which tend to be scenes of Chinese figures or Chinese landscapes. But so what would be the interest of the um, buying audience to have Peruvian scenes on, um, uh, done by Chinese artists? Because I imagine it would not be any cheaper than having them done elsewhere. So what would be their specific interest in having these Peruvian scenes done by Chinese artists at great expense? Uh, I, I assume because uh, these um, subjects they were mainly sold in Peru, so it's not aimed for the Chinese collectors or the Westerners 
um, travelers who went to China back then. So for the Peruvian audience, it's also very fascinating to just to connect uh, something that's with different materials, but very similar uh, Xiang that they, they were very familiar with. I hope I answered that's your right, question. That's a great answer. Thank you. Do we have any more, more questions from the, from the audience or maybe online? I'm, I'm not sure if I, I can't see from here. <laughs> Oh, we have a question from the front. Uh, I have a question for uh, Xin Wu. So uh, about this uh, Peruvian uh, painting, are they also the Peruvian uh, export painting? Uh, so, sorry, you mean the, the you do uh, you did a com com uh, com comparison between the Chinese piece paper? Export painting yeah. and the uh, Peruvian uh, export painting, yeah. and they are also nearly the same size on paper uh, with watercolor. Yeah. So my questions are: Were they the export painting in Peru, and they were bought? Uh, they, they were brought by the merchants from Peru to China. Do you know what kind of a uh, painting they are? Um. The the uh, the painting set made by um, Pancho Firo that's mainly circulated in the South America and also the United States. So uh, I haven't encountered any of them um, used to be circulated in China yet. So I'm also not sure they were the export paintings or not. I'm afraid. <laughs> Yeah, we have a question here at the front. Well, maybe it's not a question, it's an addition. Um, <clears throat> the piece paper paintings were not always recognized as, as a material, and in some smaller museums, they are kept uh, under the collection of, um, for instance, flowers or botanical collections, or Mm, other titles, so smaller museums, they just don't know what they have, yeah. and they're very. It's, it is a very fragile material. Yes. So, like, as far as I know, um, there are some collections in um, Russian territory, like in Ural or Siberian museums uh, coming from China, and they just don't know what they have, mm -hmm. so it's not described. Or yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and also in some European uh, museum institutions, they recorded the material as rice paper. Mm. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. it's a common name here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Do we, have, do we have any more questions from the audience? Then maybe I think it is time to round up. Can I then ask everyone for one last round of applause for our presenters? You did a great job. Okay, so closing remarks. That's on your schedule. That's the next item. So um, I, you will be pleased to know that my closing remarks will be very short, um, very brief. Um, but I did, I did, as I was sort of thinking about what I wanted to say, I thought it has been a remarkable array of topics that we heard about. Um, so I was just writing down the various countries we heard about, the low countries, Korea, Japan, China, Vietnam, France, Britain, Hong Kong, India, Indonesia, Peru. I'm sure there's ones that I forgot, but that's pretty impressive. And surfaces, we talked about bodies and pith paper and metals and woods and ceramics. I'm sure there are other uh, surfaces we talked about different kinds of objects, coaches, types, letter types, matrices, prints, cabinets, spaces, lots of different disciplines, anthropology, art history, history, cultural studies, history of collecting, material science, restoration, colonialism, I mean, all kinds of things. I could have spent, if I had the time, 
um, going through very carefully everything we covered, a much wider range. But the point is not to try and sum it up, but to give you a sense of what an extraordinary array um, we had presented to us today. Um, and I think it's not just because this is a very rich field and we have a wonderful collection here and there is a lot of material to work with when we say this is um, a symposium on Asian art. It's because we had such a wonderfully diverse group of presenters. Um, it's the presenters who brought all this all kinds of identities and experiences and perspectives and thoughts and analyses and questions and critical comments and suggestions. And I think having this group here present in this, on this occasion to us here really has been a privilege. And it has been um, very enriching as a member of the audience just sitting there listening to it. And I, I feel sure that you all um, felt that way too, and I hope even those of us, uh, those who were in the audience online, uh, also had a chance to have the benefit from that. So when I say, you know, we benefited, what do I mean with we? I guess we here maybe in the museum, or maybe we here as members of the KVVAK, or maybe we here academics in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, but we is a very... Um, um, fluid entity, and I feel that's also everyone who's here. We have all uh, learned a great deal from this, and we hope that you will all stay in contact, stay in contact with us. Um, if you are not a member, then I very much hope that you might consider becoming a member of the KVVAK. Um, if you're a student, it's very cheap. It's, <laughs> it's very cheap, and you get a very nice... Um, uh, Asiatic Kunst journal uh, uh, every uh, every few months, um, but you also get these kind of gatherings, and you get much more than that. You get access to the museum too, so it's definitely worth considering. Um, but I hope we can think about more structural ways of keeping in touch. I hope we can do something with the fact that we actually have a large community of people who are not only interested in Asian art, I mean, that is certainly a very wide community now, but also quite a strong community of experts in our museums throughout the country, um, in our various collections, in um, various, almost all of the universities um, in the Netherlands. And we have resources, it seems, and I think we need to make the most of that so that we can make this a more regular and even more regular, maybe even slightly more um, on a strong financial basis so that we can really be um, more generous in inviting people and supporting people while they are here. Those are some of the things that we are thinking of. And from all of you in the room, and online, we would love to hear suggestions. If you have comments, observations, criticisms, any ideas for how we could do things better or what you like us to do, please let us know. Um, I think we need to end with some very uh, heartfelt thanks because this day would not have happened without uh, some very important people and I want to begin by thanking the tech team the people who've been in the background um, we've been you know saying more lights or less lights or more sound my mic doesn't work and they've just done it all they've made it possible so thank you very much And that includes also Sandra Pastor. These are people who've been in the background. They've worked incredibly hard. They've been running around making everything happen. So thank you. Um, I don't think we will do an applause for all, each of them because we will be here for quite a while because I've got quite a long list here. Um, the curators. The curators were involved in various ways, but especially yesterday hosting us, those of us who were... Um, involved in the organization, but also all of the presenters, and we had a look at the objects in the, uh, in the gallery. We heard some great suggestions for how things can be changed, and hopefully we will be able to use them. But the curators put a lot of time and effort into that, and we're very, very grateful for that. Um, I want to mention the KVVAK 
Um, as I said, I hope many of you, if you're not a member, will become a member, but the KVVAK as a committee also decided to sponsor this, and we are very grateful for the financial support that made this day possible. A lot of colleagues, uh, many of them are here, but not all of them are here, and I'm thinking, for example, about Eline, um, were involved in creating the call for papers and going through that very uh, extensive selection process. Um, that, that was quite, you know, it was great to have so many applicants, but it was a lot of work selecting this very fine group of people that we selected. So thank you for everyone who was involved in that, and thank you for the chairs, those who chaired our four panels today. Um, I, I mentioned already when I said some words at the start of the day, uh, Thomas van Gulik and Pauline Kruseman and Jan Maarten Bol were very generous in further supporting this, and that is really... Uh, we're very grateful for that, and, and this could not have happened without them. Um, but it really couldn't have happened without Rosaline. So I think Rosaline absolutely deserves a big applause. <laughs> All those who have uh, who are present here and those who have been presenting have received many emails and she has done a fantastic job so thank you and the booklet also entirely her doing so thank you um, what i would like to do uh, is invite um, first of all all of the speakers and we would like to have a photo with all of the speakers in front of this image that we chose so if I could ask you all to come down and then I will I think we'll have a second photo which has all of the chairs uh, and those who've been involved in the photo as well um, but while everyone gathers and while because some of you might have a train to catch or something to rush off to. I think one more round of applause to thank our audience for fantastic questions and wonderful commitment in being here. So thank you, everyone. Okay, so the first photo in front of the screen of all of the uh, uh, presenters. Thank you all very much. 